but our need to exploit the resources has also led to what we call progress, has led to what we call evolution. This evolution has led to an increase in temperature. In the past 50 years, we have increased temperature in 0.5 degrees, and it is expected in the next 40 years, we may have a 2% uh, sorry, a two-degree increase in temperature. What happens if we do this? If we have a two-degree increase in temperature, basically the glaciers are gonna melt. The acidity in the ocean is gonna change. And I don't know if you know, but right now the biggest uh, repository of, uh, of uh, CO2, the CO2 that is not in the environment pretty much killing us and killing birds, it's in the oceans, at the bottom of the ocean. So if we change the acidity, of the ocean, that CO2 is going to be released to the atmosphere. And my favorite phrase, we're all going to die. <laughs> so what we need to do, according to all the genius in the, in the United Nations, uh, Dr. Pachauri, who's a very crazy guy, but a genius too, in, in anything to do with climate change, he has determined that if we are to save ourselves, we need to make sure that we reduce emissions 60 to 90%. In that way, that's the only way we are going to avoid having an increase of 2 centigrade in the, in the, in the world's temperature. It gets scary, right? <clears throat> so I should have used this before, but anyway, this slide is to show what has happened, right? I mean, we started with the Industrial Revolution, and we thought that we were doing fantastic things. We, were, we thought we were doing great things, and we were evolving. And um, right now, we're at a point in which everybody right now has an iPhone, has a PDA, has a computer, is driving a car, wants an electric car, and if you go home, you have a wireless router, and everything is connected. We're consuming energy like crazy. We increase the level of consumption. Did you hear about uh, the claims from the New York Times about the amount of energy that Google uses in every search? Probably you guys heard about it. You didn't? Well, apparently Google, every time you do a search, you use about 0.2 grams of, uh, you do release because of the energy that you use, 0.2 grams of CO2. And if you turn on your computer, you use an extra seven grams. Apparently there is 4.9 billion searches every day in Google. So if we start adding, we're talking about per year, close to 850 uh, million tons of CO2 that we release because we use the internet. Isn't that funny? I mean, things that we have absolutely no idea. I mean, we're very green, right? I don't drive, I walk. But I search the internet like crazy, and it's just a funny thing. It just makes me think. So we started think, talking about definitions. We went from clean tech to sustainability to carrying capacity to consumption to climate change. And then we come back precisely to clean tech. So all this was to tell you what clean tech is. So right now, we're trying to find a way of mitigating the effects of climate change that were produced for our excess in consumption. So when we define clean tech, we talk about a product, we talk about an end service that is designed to help us mitigate the effects of climate change. So we're all in agreement? We all know what climate, uh, clean tech is? Excellent. But I bet you don't know what a ton of CO2 is, because we hear that a lot. Uh, I don't know if you heard about the Kyoto Protocol, but in there a lot of people committed to reducing CO2 emissions, but we have no idea what CO2 emissions are. And I just told you that Google is going to spend 850 million tons of CO2, and all of you looked at me like, of course, that's a lot. But I'm not really sure that you knew what that is, right? Every million ton of CO2 is equivalent to 173,000 passenger vehicles. So when somebody says we're going to reduce 50 million CO2 uh, tons of CO2 this year, for example, Mexico saying that right now. That means that they're gonna remove 50 times 173,000 passenger vehicles from the roads. They're not gonna do that, but they're gonna find a way of getting close to do that. So basically this is so you have an idea of what a ton of CO2 is. I have a question. Sure. That means that you have 173,000 people at the same time simultaneously Working? Yes. Or, yeah. Yes, that's what it means. It, it, it's crazy, you know? I mean, when we, when we think about the gallons of gasoline here, um, it's just ridiculous. But when we start looking at the carbon emissions that we have uh, at the world level, at the global level, it's, it's impressive. It's amazing. The biggest polluters in the world are, of course, China, the US, 
Uh, India is, uh, Russia is number three, and this is a very funny thing, by the way, but uh, I'll tell you about it, I get very excited with that one. Uh, as a blog, Europe is number three, uh, India is number four, and, but the Russia thing, this is, this is awesome, because when the Kyoto Protocol was, uh, when they first came up with the, with the Kyoto Protocol, all the information we had in terms of emissions was coming from the ex-USSR. So they basically were polluting like crazy. And every country with the, that signed the Kyoto Protocol committed to reduce emissions. They said, like, oh, no, I'm going to reduce emissions. Overall, all together was going to be 5.2% of world emissions from 1990. And Russia, two days ago, basically stood in front of everybody in Copenhagen and said, I don't know about you, but I managed to reduce my emissions by like 90%. And what happened was that now it's Russia. It's not the USSR. So basically, Russia is saying, I don't give a damn. And, and I, I to reduce my emissions, I win. <laughs> Screw you. <laughs> and, and it, it's just funny, you know. And it's ridiculous that we are talking in those terms. They're using whatever they can to negotiate right now, and, and you know, it's pissing me off. But anyway, uh, but part of the focus here is Latin America. So when we're talking about Latin America, we need to look at where our countries are. So Mexico is the number twelve polluter in the world. We should be very proud, but we need to, you know, try to be top ten because that's what we do, right? So then we have Brazil, 17, Argentina, 26, and thank God, Venezuela, Colombia, Chile, Peru. They are all outside the top 30. Not very much outside the top 30, but they are outside the top 30, and that's why we don't have them here. But in terms of global emissions, as of 2006, is 28,431 million, which is 4.9 billion passenger vehicles. This is the amount of emissions that the world issued in 2006. This is equivalent to giving a car to each person in the world. So we, we need to do something about it. And this is what this is all about. So I start asking you if you know what the Kyoto Protocol is. I mean, does anybody know what the Kyoto Protocol is? I mean, you guys heard about it. And I'm sure you can explain to me very clearly what the whole thing is. <laughs> uh, but the, the Kyoto Protocol was pretty much, uh, it all started once upon a time in Rio de Janeiro in Earth Summit in 1992, when everybody was like, you know, guys, we, we really need to do something to reduce emissions. We need to figure out a way of motivating people to reduce emissions. And they were like, yeah, that's cool, man. So let's uh, let's all agree on how much we need to do. So they did a lot of research. They got a lot of guys that were really smart. And they figured out that we needed to reduce emissions by 5.2% compared to levels from 1990. So the whole world decided they have to do that. But some pollute more than others, so pretty much some countries had to commit to reduce emissions by 7%. Some countries had to commit to reduce emissions by 1%. But at the end of the day, everybody had to reduce emissions altogether by 5.2%. This was uh, finally put in writing in 1997. And it's when people, like everybody worked in 1992, like world friends, the US and Russia and everybody. Uh, 1997, the US starts, you know what? I don't think it's cool. I don't think I'm going to do that. It's going to affect my economy. Uh, I'm not sure I want to sign that. So it took about eight years to get the Kyoto Protocol going. The Kyoto Protocol, we've been talking about it forever, but it really, really started in 2005. 2005 with Australia being the last country to sign and ratify the Kyoto Protocol. And China and the US officially say, screw you, I'm not gonna sign that thing. So then the problems started. And the problems came with Al Gore talking about polar bears dying and things like that, Disney doing movies about Wally. And then we all started talking about the end of the world. But we are all gonna die. <laughs> but uh, but they were right. Uh, about three years ago, we started talking about Copenhagen, and the reason we started talking about Copenhagen was because the Kyoto Protocol was due to expire in 2012. Uh, the funny thing was that in 2012, because between 2008 and 2012, everybody was supposed to reduce emissions, as they said. But as you know, only Russia managed to reduce <laughs> emissions enough to meet uh, the objectives of the Kyoto Protocol. So right now we're trying to figure out what to do. Part of the problem was that only 37 countries ratified the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, out of 150 countries right now talking in Copenhagen, well, the number changed, 192, 110, 150, but I don't know, a lot of countries talking about what to do next in Copenhagen. And the idea is get involved, not only the industrialized nations, not only the US, not only Europe, not only Russia and China, but all the developing countries. And I don't know if you have heard the news. Have you seen anything about what's going on in Copenhagen right now? It's awesome. It's a complete nightmare. Uh, 